Welcome everybody. Just for everybody knows, we are recording this. So if you know somebody that doesn't, hasn't, couldn't make it tonight, go to our Facebook page and you'll we'll see the recording of it. And all the classes we've had are been recorded too, so you can see the classes on there. Um, what else? Okay. So our next. So for April 16th, we're gonna have Scott. And how do you say his last name? Scoberbo. I can't ever say that one. So he's the Fort Collins Wholesale Nursery down at Fort Collins. He's gonna be here talking about trees and shrubs for the Northeast Wyoming that will do good here and stuff. And he's bringing some door prizes that people will probably wanna come just to, there'll be unusual stuff that you usually can't buy at places. So that's a good one if you want something different for tree or shrub. Um, it's going to be in the afternoon. We're probably we're kind of finding at one o'clock, depending how the weather and stuff is. We'll narrow it down as we get closer. So watch our Facebook page for the time that we're doing it. And that one's going to be held at the um, George Amos um, building down on Main Street instead of here. So that one will be moved down there. And our next our next class in May is going to be about landscaping and edible landscaping and stuff. So that one's going to be in May. And June is going to be about watering, and that's going to be about drip systems, um, sprinklers, all that kind of stuff about um, watering. And July is our garden walk that we do, um, and then we also do the Fourth of July parade. So if anybody knows anybody that has a beautiful yard. Put that down on your, the sheet that you're going to turn in afterwards. Um, we're looking for some more unique yards and stuff. It can be from greenhouse things or anything, um, waterless, gardening, whatever, butterfly, habitat, anything like that. Um, so make sure if you know somebody has good, I, you guys have a good yard? No. But if you know anybody or if you're driving around, Always call the extension office and let Mandy know too. Um, but welcome everybody to our show for tonight. And then Mandy here is going to go over. Did everybody grab one of these little chart things? These are kind of a lifesaver in a way sometimes. They're really unique. She's going to explain that a little bit better. So um, we already talked about Scott, and that's pretty exciting that he's going to be here. So that's. Um, He's uh, the, one of our big speakers that we're bringing in this year. So he is um, phenomenal. So you guys will want to make sure that you come downtown for that. So um, another thing before, just a couple housekeeping items. I don't know if you guys saw our tree sale information. Um, we have the large lot tree sale and then the smaller, the individual lots. Um, and they are going fast. So um, if you want to get your orders in, just bring them by the extension office and um, we will uh, take your order and get that going. And then at the end of the program, or while you're taking the program, if you guys would fill this out, um, this survey is from the University of Wyoming, and it's how we get our funding for um, these types of um, programs. programs. But I can't talk. I just got back from vacation. It was very <laughs> nice to be here. Um, so anyways, yeah. So if you guys would just fill these out, um, that would be great and like rich said if you know of a yard um you know maybe not put your neighbor's name on there if you don't tell them but you know um, we're always looking for new yards and sometimes um i know one of the master gardeners has said that she will go and kind of look around in people's yards and say oh yeah this is a good one and you know so then she'll go approach them so um i know a lot of you guys have taken this uh, these events before but uh, this is the garden um, planner it's a slider and um, if you are new to it I just want to run through it really quick because it's the best tool um, there's a, a fall side and a spring side and so right now since we're in spring we're going to put it on the spring side <laughs> and so this little slider um, you just move this um, the slider part over to um, the average last spring frost and we're going to put that right on the line between May 17th and May 24th um, and then so that line it is going to tell you then at that point when you go to the left of that line you're going to see FP or SI the SI
I is for starting those seeds inside. That's when you'll want to start those plants. So for like broccoli, lettuce, I've never started lettuce inside, but broccoli you could start like March 29th. So anytime um, you could start your seeds inside. And then the FP is your first planting outside. So that's kind of a, a handy tool you can go up and see that um, you should be planting your peas around April 12th. And then um, over to the right hand side, you'll see the green check marks. That's when you can expect your harvest. And then all the way over to the right in the blue writing, those are your companion plants for your plants out to the left. So we want our plants to be friends. Um, <coughs> And be by their neighbors that they get along with and then all the way over to the um, left hand side in the red you'll see it'll say like how far apart to, to plant your rows how deep to plant your seeds um, so it, it's just a very helpful tool it also has on there like the temperature um, the minimum minimum outdoor soil temperature for germination so that's also very helpful because if you plant your seeds too early, it doesn't get warm enough, they're not going to germinate, nothing's going to grow. So then you'll just start all over again. Yeah, that's what we do. Um, which is okay too. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. So we have seeds up here too. So help yourselves to the seeds afterwards and stuff. Um, you can go down to the extension office too. We have a big library full of seeds, all different kinds rolls and stacks of stacks of these so please go down there they're free they don't cost anything there's just a book that you sign like a login book and then yeah. on that part there but very they're free so go down there and help yourself and we also um took three of these displays down to right so if you have any friends or family down in right um go ahead and tell them too if they are the right branch library and it's the same thing they're free they can go in there and get them and we just restocked it two weeks so and they do have a shelf life you guys certain seeds do expire so definitely look at these look at the ones in the office because we'll have more coming in this year but we want to make sure that these go and it just killed me when I see somebody in one of the stores in town I saw a lady with a whole bunch of sunflower seeds the other day and I was like I could save you ten dollars <laughs> So it's in the George Amos Memorial Building. It's the building that's directly north of the courthouse downtown. It's the it's the big brick building down the hill from the courthouse. And so you, if you're looking at the front of the building, you'll go up the stairs and into the upstairs, and it's the room all the way in the back. Okay, and the extension office is in the lower level of that same building. Okay, thank you. That right next to it is the first one. Yeah, the title. Yeah. First one title. Anybody else have any questions before we get started? Yeah. Does everybody have a ticket? Does everybody get a ticket for drawing? You should draw right here. No. Yeah. It gave me one. And it's not just flowers, you guys. The seed catalog, there's vegetables, there's flowers, there's varieties of squashes. Um, like I said, there's probably five or six different varieties of sunflowers. So please come down because we'll stock it back up again for next year. Are there herbs? <laughs> the last three numbers are 873. 873. Oh, did you okay. yeah, winner. We have a pollinator <laughs> book. So, um, and that will lead us into um, our master gardener, Mary Schoen, is going to talk to us about pollinators. So, we'll do, leave her with that. Thank you. Thank you, the tiger. <laughs> Hi guys. Damn. Hello. How's everybody this evening? Good. Good. So I was originally um, asked if I could talk about pollinators. And I said, do you want the plants or do you want the actual insects? And they said yes. <laughs> so when I started working on this, I was having a great time. I just learned so much in this and, and I hope you guys do too. But I couldn't decide how to name it. So I started with pollinators and went, well, but we really want to talk about how we get them to our gardens, right? 
But to do that, we also need to understand what pollination is. We all think we know, and we need to know what pollen is. So <coughs> what do you all think of as pollen? It's the yellow powdery stuff. Exactly. <laughs> what else? Causes hay fever? Yeah, I'm just not sure. Okay, so um, I started very basically with what is pollen. Well, pollen is actually the male reproductive part of plants. So just like humans, plants need a male and a female, by and large. Not exclusively, but by and large when we're talking about our gardens. So it um, is produced in the anther in angiosperms and in the cone in gymnosperms. So those are big words. Those are college words, right? So what is an angiosperm and what is a gymnosperm? I said, I'm into it. Let's bunny trail a little bit. So an angiosperm basically is what we think of as a flower, right? <coughs> and I'm going to clarify what a flower actually is in just a minute. Um, so those flowers that we look at, um, whether it's a, a lily or whether it's a daisy or whether it's a sunflower or a tomato bloom, they have male parts, they have female parts. Some of them have both, and some of them actually have sterile structures. So if you've ever bought a special, real pretty new flower at the nursery, and you ask them, can I take the seeds from these and plant them next year? Sometimes they say, yeah, probably not. They're sterile, okay? And that's, that's why it's part of the, the crossbreeding process. But <laughs> I'm not gonna get into that. If we have uh, an angiosperm, a beautiful little angiosperm up here, right there, and it has both male and female parts, we call that a perfect flower. That generally means it can self-pollinate. Whatever you can get, okay? A gymnosperm, on the other hand, is this little guy, a pine tree. All kinds of different conifer trees out there. They have cones, but they don't have a perfect cone. They have male cones and female cones. So if you've ever been <laughs> up around in the mountains somewhere where they have a lot of conifer trees in early summer, usually early June, you see that yellow powder all over everything. That's the male cones spreading their pollen like crazy. It goes everywhere, and it goes into your lungs, and you sneeze, or your nose, and you sneeze as well. Okay, so these are two flowers. On the right, we'll start there. This is a male flower right here. It has the male parts. Basically, the stamen is the combination of the anther and the filament that compose the male. Over on the left, we have a perfect flower. So it has both male and female parts. Now I want to clarify, I keep saying flower. What is a flower? A flower is actually the reproductive part of the plant. What we typically call a flower is actually a bloom. So just a little bit of a distinction there. Okay, so pollination again, you have to have a fertilized egg. So when the pollen reaches the tip of the stigma, a pollen tube grows and goes down, delivers the egg, or fertilizes the egg, basically. Then a seed can form and a fruit can grow. So that's pretty cool. Now, some fruits, vegetables, have multiple ovules or ovaries. If you slice an apple across, you're going to see a star-shaped group of seeds, right? So pollen has to reach all of those ovules for that fruit to properly develop. Another example would be a watermelon. Think about all the seeds in a watermelon. Another example, and I'll mention it again later, is corn on the cob. Okay. So it can be very simple, it can be very complex. So how many flowers are on a bloom? Up at the top we have a lily that has one flower, one reproductive part to it. But the sunflower, daisies, that kind, are actually multiple flowers. That center head, if you've ever dried a sunflower and all the seeds that pop out at the end of the season, those are all individual flowering units. So they are, and each one of them to properly develop um, has to have pollen. Okay, whoops, the right button here. So plants are literally stuck in 
the ground. How do we get the pollen to them? They can't just get up and go get it, right? We have to deliver it to them, all right? So there are two mechanisms for getting pollen to the flowering unit. One of them is wind. If we think about grasses, we think about ragweed, conifer trees, also corn. I keep mentioning corn because it's really interesting. Um, that pollen that we see from, for instance, the conifer trees is really fine and it makes a layer on everything. That's because wind isn't a very efficient delivery system. The wind <laughs> picks up that pollen and just broadcasts it, like you would broadcast a handful of wildflower seeds in the meadow. And you can't guarantee that pollen's actually in the land where it needs to go. So there is a lot of pollen, and it's very tiny. Right. For the corn, the interesting thing about corn is when you shuck corn, all the silks that are in there, every one of those silks connects to a kernel. And the wind has to reach every one of those silks for a kernel to develop, for a full corn on top. It, that's just amazing. <coughs> that boggles my mind. But nature does take care of it. Um, the other type of pollination is by animals. Typically, it's going to be insects. Uh, birds might do a little bit, but typically we're talking about insects. So the pollen in these guys, because insects are transporting the pollen from flower to flower, we don't need as much pollen. And that pollen tends to be a larger grain. It tends to have a rougher surface, so that it will stick to the hairs and the feet of the pollinators. And it also has really high nutritional value. So. Uh, that one in mind. All right, let's see if we understand what we've talked about so far. So is pollen male or female? Male. Excellent. What is a perfect flower? Male and soft pollen. Both male and female, right? Name two plants that contain multiple ovules. Apples and watermelons. Maybe one say? plant that exhibits inflorescence, and that's my bad. Inflorescence is a complex cluster of flowers. Okay, so let's meet who the pollinators are. Uh, bats and birds can do a little bit, but mostly we're, we're concerned about our bees, our hummingbirds, our butterflies. But in there too are moths, beetles, wasps, and even flies. So why do pollinators do this? Do they go into our yards and go, hmm, you look like you need some help here. They want the food. They want the nectar. Right? They're looking for the food that's going to give them the energy to do what they do, which is to make nests, to meet other bees or other moths or whatever, and to have babies. That's their life cycle. Um, and bees make honey, which is all good. So after they, they visit one plant, they have pollen on them in one form or another, and they visit another plant, and another plant, and another plant. Now not every flower they visit is going to be able to accept the pollen that they just brought it, because they do need to be generally in the same species of flower. Did I just kill it? There. Okay. Um, so, interesting little tidbit. The oldest known pollinators are flies and beetles. They go back about 150 million years. That's a lot of years. <laughs> they say that um, cockroaches can survive a nuclear blast. So, pollinators don't do too bad either. Um, bees only came on board about 100 million years ago. And beetles, I like, I mean, we have a lot of beetles. Not all beetles are good, obviously. We've got some that, that are disease-causing and kill trees and things like that. But the ladybug is certainly a beetle. Um, they crawl around. They get the pollen stuck to their feet. And they, therefore, need the kind of flower that's a little flatter, a little more open. Um, they give the example in the text that I was reading that magnolias and water lilies but also think simple things like asters, where they can get in there. There's a lot of stamens and pistils. They're easy access. Sometimes the beetles will chew on the flower as well. They're not the best pollinators, but they do a little bit. Uh, okay. 
and flies. Flies are everywhere. We all know that all summer long. We're walking around with our fly slaughter. Did you? Um, but they actually do a little bit of work of pollination, and it's really not that bad just by sheer numbers. Um, same type of thing with the beetles. They'll, they'll get it stuck to their feet, and then when they go to another flower, some of that pollen will fall off onto the other flower. So we get a little bit of pollination there. There's a couple kinds of flies that actually aren't bad at pollinating because they are, have a little bit of a hair to them. So that hair branches and the pollen will stick to the hair as well as to their feet. So that improves the pollination ability of those um, flies. And I did not know this, but flies pollinate strawberries, onions, and carrots if they're allowed to flower out. That's kind of cool. I have strawberries. Hopefully they'll do their job. <laughs> Maybe I won't kill them the whole time. <laughs> um, and flies, interesting to know, are important in the colder areas of the world, probably because the other pollinators can't survive at those cold temperatures. Okay, butterflies. Who, who doesn't love butterflies? They are awesome, right? They're not the best pollinators. They don't have the hair that the bees have, but they do have long tongues. So they can go into some of the different flowers, a little bit more complex flower structure. Um, and uh, there's so many types and they're just so beautiful. So I think I figured out what I was doing wrong here. Moths also are pollinators. We don't tend to see them much. There are some very beautiful moths. When I was putting this together, I found some that I would have sworn were actually butterflies. They're just real pretty. I just don't think we have them up here. So. <laughs> A couple of types of moths actually do have a, a kind of symbiotic sort of relationship with some of the orchids. So that was interesting. The thing about moths uh, that, I, that I think is really cool, you know how we might plant, say, a morning glory or a moonflower? Does anybody ever plant those? Yeah. So morning glories open in the morning, moonflowers open in the evening, right? Well, think about moths. A lot of them have a nocturnal lifestyle. They like it better at night. Uh, some of them are diurnal, so they're up and around during the day. And some of them have that dawn to dusk pattern that I can never pronounce, crepuscular. Another college word for you. Um, and they actually do a little bit of pollinating. They're kind of accidental pollinators just because it gets stuck to their feet, but they do travel around from flower to flower. Again, they want the nectar for the energy, right, to do their work. Their sole purpose in life, basically, when they emerge as adults, is to mate and die. <laughs> so, there you go. Wasps, best bids. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're carnivores as larvae, as larva. so when they're developing before they emerge, they actually eat uh, insect flesh and different things that mama will bring back. When they're adults, though, they are carbohydrate based, so they like the nectar as well, but they don't have, they don't have the, uh, the hair like a bee has. So they also are going to be using primarily their feet, unless they happen to be a pollen wasp. Um, then they're a little bit more like a bee. But um, so this is a good point to kind of touch on right now, and we'll talk about it some more. They like the sweet nectar, the rotting fruit, and soda pop. We see them around the garbage cans and the parks and all of that kind of thing. So when we think about the nectar, different flowers have different sugar content or nutritional value in their nectar, okay? So the more sugar, the more hyped up, the more energy, right, rapid energy that they're going to burn, the more these pollinators like it. And wasps in particular really like that super sugar. So now pollen wasps, they collect the nectar and the pollen and take it back to the nest for their young, which is a lot like some of the bees, like bees do. So bees don't just consume the nectar, they gather the pollen deliberately. That's part of what makes them such a wonderful pollinator, is they are not just having it stick to their hair and their feet, they're deliberately putting it there. And they take it back to their nest for the young. Very cool. Um, there are over 4,000 species of bees in North America, and I'm no bee spurt, but uh, Mandy does have a book on bees of North America, 
and so I'm sure there's probably one at the library here as well. So bees have an interesting, interesting habit called flower constancy. If you ever observe your bees in your garden, you tend to see them go from maybe tomato blossom to tomato blossom to tomato blossom to tomato blossom, not darting around. And that's just an interesting thing about the bees. That makes them a better pollinator, really, because they're delivering the pollen to the plant that can accept the pollen. So in one foraging trip, one female bee can visit hundreds of the same kind of flower. And then she'll go back to the nest. Now the next day she may go somewhere else and do a little bit different work. But that makes them really excellent pollinators. <clears throat> All right, test time. <coughs> what is the primary reason pollinators visit flowering plants? Food, absolutely. Uh, bees have a habit of flower constancy. What is that? Did I not explain that very well? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they kind of stick with one type of flower in one trip. And what are the oldest known pollinators, or who are the oldest known pollinators? Beetles. Bees. And, uh, no, no, beetles. 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 Fly, right? And what pollinator is a carnivore in the larval stage? Wasps. They even sound nasty, don't they? And why are bees the best pollinators? Because they deliberately collect pollen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Among other things, right? The flower constancy also. Okay. All right. So now we're up to the fun part. How do you attract these guys? So, does anybody have a pollinator garden? Plant flowers specifically to try to attract them from your neighbor's yard? <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> okay, don't admit it. We know you do. No. <laughs> um, so definitely, when you when you think about, gee, I really want more bees. I really want more butterflies. I want them to visit my yard. They're always down at my neighbor's yard over here. What am I doing? Oh. Well, there's some science behind it. It is not hard and fast. And the reason it's not hard and fast is that our environment changes everything. It depends on what is your neighbor doing. It depends on what you have. What are you growing? What are your conditions in your yards? It's all shaded with a bunch of big trees and all of that, and you've just got a little shade garden. Yeah, maybe not going to have as many pollinators. But in general, a few things that are interesting um, are flower size, flower color, time of blooming, aroma, um, the flower structure, complex flowers like lupines, simple flowers like asters. Um, and in general, we're going to want to have a little of everything, right? to try to attract as many pollinators as possible and keep them there as long as possible. The more food we give them, the happier they're going to be, the longer they're going to stay, right? So, but red flowers do tend to attract pollinators that see red, and that would be hummingbirds. Hummingbirds, right? All the feeders have red on them. So, interesting fact about birds, they don't in general smell. So the aroma of the flowers isn't necessarily what's going to attract them. They might be attracted because of the red they see. We, uh, when we lived in the mountains, we had hundreds, maybe, of hummingbirds every year. And um, bunny trailing a little bit for you. Hummingbirds actually have some constancy built into them, and it's more of a location constancy. So when they would arrive, usually about the second week in May, we'd be working away in the office and we'd hear a little tick, tick, tick on the glass. Tick, tick, tick. You're like, really? You think? And you'd go out there and there's a hummingbird right at the window like, could you feed me now? Yeah. It's been a long trip. <laughs> I came up from South America. Um, and so they would bring their young and all that. But always the hummingbird feeders have red on them. And I could put on a pink shirt or a red shirt and go out back where we had one of the, the prime hummingbird feeders that they really liked, and they would come up and buzz all around trying to decide if I was a flower. So it obviously had nothing to do with scent. 
or size or anything. It had to do with the color. Now, once they were there and found kind of their niche again, they would go to other flowers as well. But the red would attract them. Um, oops. Now, blue flowers tend to attract pollinators that see the other end of the visible spectrum, the ultraviolet end. And that would be bees. So very often you will see a lot of purple or blue in a pollinator garden to initially attract the, the bees. But again, they like diversity, so they would stay and they would visit all the different flowers. So pollinator gardens are becoming kind of a big thing. A lot of parks have them. I think we have a pollinator garden at the Urban Orchard. And it's, it's fun, it's beautiful. Um, there's a variety of ways to build a pollinator garden. Some of them are elaborate and big, probably half the size of this front area. And then there's the pollinator gardens in our backyards that might just be a strip along the fence line. So same general sorts of principles apply. The primary goal that we're looking for is to have the diversity that we need to keep as many pollinators for as long as we possibly can. Okay, and they're driving their, their thriving goal is food. So some of the flowers have more nectar than others, um, or better nectar, correct that, it has better nectar than others, and they will attract to those flowers because they're getting a lot, a lot of bang for their buck. The energy they expend is being rewarded with a lot of nutrition, which gives them the energy to find their mates and to, to nest. Um, when you do put in flowers to attract pollinators. In general, you want to go for more of a sunny location. There can be a little bit of shade, but it shouldn't be shaded all day. And you don't want your trees or big shrubs to block the sky from the pollinators because they actually, in order to fly and orient correctly, they need to be able to see the sky. So. Um, talking about your neighbor's backyard. So if I'm in my backyard here and two houses down, Susie has tons of bees and tons of beautiful butterflies and I just have a couple. So I want to attract them to my yard. Well, a couple things are possible. She's planting some really attractive stuff over there that they really love. Maybe there's a nesting area kind of close by, which would make it Pretty, pretty convenient. I mean, who wants to go 50 miles to the grocery store if you can go a mile, right? <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go ahead and pick some flowers and I'm gonna plant a pollinator garden along my fence. <clears throat> She's over there with all these beautiful pollinators that I want to attract. Am I gonna put my pollinator garden over here or over here? What do you think? Closest to her. Closest to her, yeah. why? Well, one thing to keep in mind is a lot of the pollinators, and that includes our bees, don't necessarily fly long distances. The average bee can fly about 500 feet at one time. That's less than a tenth of a mile. That's not very far. A bumblebee, on the other hand, can fly a mile. But I'm guessing, I don't know the data for sure, but I'm guessing butterflies probably don't fly long distances. I mean, you just think about the enormous energy that's required for them. They, they fly through the air, but they're still flapping wings, right? Um, beetles certainly don't travel long distances. So those are things to keep in mind. Um, in general, when you're going to plant flowers, do you want to plant one or two types, or do you want to plant more? Well, more, right? Because again, we want that diversity. We want to consider height, we want to consider size, we want to consider the structure of the flower, the color of the flower, <coughs> how much nectar, how much good nectar is in there. Okay. And if you have, just a kind of an interesting little point, I, I put this in because it actually happened to me. If you have native flowers, weeds even, that seem to attract a lot of pollinators, you might want to consider leaving them in place. You might want to think about it. The story behind that is we live out in the country and we had a lot of um, tumbleweed along the edge of our driveway 
and we also have these other beads. And so I'm out there mowing everything, right? Just <clears throat> get rid of it. And then I realized I had showy milkweed, and the bees love it. So it's not terribly ugly. It's not the most beautiful of the flowers, but, but the bees like it. So I went, note to salt, let's not mow those anymore. <laughs> let's let them stay. Now, this is just an example of some things that you could consider. Uh, the butterflies, the moths, the hummingbirds, um, and the bumblebees tend to have longer tongues. So they might go for some of the more complex flowers. Um, you can have the lupines and you can have the, the salvia and, and a lot of those that have a little bit more complex flower structure than an aster, for instance. But your other guys, your flies, some of your bees, um, they might prefer, and certainly your beetles, they'll prefer a simpler flower. So you give, them a, you give them kind of that smorgasbord feel. You give them the different colors. You give them the different bloom times, the different heights, the different sizes. And it's a little of everything for everybody. And you'll just keep your pollinators very happy. The downside is um, some common flowers, pansies are one, and double pebbled sunflowers really don't have a lot of good nectar to offer. So if you do plant flowers for pollinators and you notice they're kind of ignoring some, maybe next year you don't want to put a lot of effort into those. Maybe they're just not getting what they need from them. And then always some um, butterfly bush was in some of the literature I was reading that can be invasive in some areas. I don't think that's true up here. I think they're, they're warmer, wetter areas. But do be careful of, of what you plant. It, you don't want it to take over either, so. Okay, so a couple of the books that I used um, when I was researching these are wonderful books. This one is the one that is providing the information in the next couple of slides. It has a lot of suggested flower types for different areas of the country. And so I looked at it from two standpoints. I looked at it from when they bloom, and then I looked at it from a perennial versus annual sort of aspect. So in terms of when they bloom, uh, there were quite a few in the spring category, the summer, the fall, and then some trees and shrubs to, to consider as well. The ones that I put a little star and asterisk by, we're gonna talk just a little bit more about. Um, some spring blooming and actually they could be in summer and fall as well is the blanket flower and we have some seeds right up here of the blanket flower from our office you probably can't see real well but they're a they're a pretty little flower multicolored and they're easy to grow um, the showy milkweed in the summer, the wild bergamot, the bee balm. There's so many kinds of bee balm, and we'll we'll look at a couple. And then asters, of course, are just super easy to grow, and the pollinators do love them. Then, from from a perennials and annual standpoint, um, some of the annuals are sunflowers, borage, and uh, the others. Sunflowers, as Diane had mentioned, come in a variety of heights, too. You can get the real tall six foot <coughs> sunflowers, and you can get some smaller ones. But they, they do tend to bloom like midsummer, and they last all through the fall. And you can just let them, if you want to collect the seeds and try to plant them, you can just let them go to seed and dry out, too. So we'll give some maximum benefit to the, um, to the pollinators. Um, and I actually forgot to mention something that I want to quickly backtrack on. Um, if we get the early spring blooming and the late fall blooming flowers, that can be really helpful for both the bees that emerge early and then the bumblebees that winter over. So we give them a lot of food in the fall so that they can winter over successfully and then come back to our gardens next year. So that's kind of why it's important to include those two ends of the spectrum as well. Um, on the perennials, the cat, cat mint and cat mint are great. Um, they're all great. The starred ones, again, we'll talk just a little bit more about. Let me try to fill it again here. Okay, so Anna's hyssop. Um, the 
Does anyone throw this up? Yay! Yeah. Amethyst hyssop has to be one of the best flowers ever. They're easy to start from seed. They're a perennial. They have a sugar content of over 40%. Bees love them. They go to them because it's, they get there, they've expended the energy, and they can just get fat on these things. They're really a, a lovely kind of spiring plant. Yeah. And they, because of their sugar content, they're going to attract virtually every one of the pollinators. Asters, of course, are beautiful. They come in a variety of colors, easy to raise from seed. They bloom for quite a long time, actually. Um, and because they are late summer and fall, uh, they do help the bumblebee queen. Their sugar concentration, depending on the type of aster, you can get the giant tiny aster and you can get the nice little small ones that are almost like a bachelor button. Uh, their concentration is gonna be anywhere between mid 20s on up to 40. So, very good. And bee balm, so many different varieties. <coughs> this one in particular is so beautiful and uh, so hard to grow, <laughs> at least in my yard. Um, but bee balm comes in a variety of colors, uh, styles. You've got a complex structure. You've got some fairly simple structures. They also will attract pretty much every one of the pollinators. And then the blanket flower, like I was just showing you, has a sugar content over 30%. So with its long blooming, that's great food for those pollinators. And it's drought tolerant, which is wonderful. Again, that's a, a uh, the inflorescence here in the blanket flower of the mini little flower. Catnip and catmint. Does anybody grow catnip? Catnip? Kathy does. Yeah. These are wonderful plants. I have a story that actually goes with catmint. As, um, as an adult, I didn't know what they were until I saw them at somebody's home and they told me, I was like, that is gorgeous. What do you call that? They said, it's Catman. It's everywhere. And I'm like, okay. Um, when we were growing up, my mom had a bush outside her front door and she called it, we called it the bee bush. And it was always loaded with bees. So as kids, we would run real quick past it because we didn't want the bees to get us. And she kept laughing at us saying, they don't care about you. They've got what they want. Um, Catmint is a wonderful <laughs> perennial. You can start it from seed. It will bloom like this all summer long into the fall. It's just delightful. Both catnip, so this is catnip over here, and catmint on the right are part of the nepeta genus. So sometimes people confuse the two, but they really are different species within that genus. Um, their sugar content is in the 20s, but the bees like it. And then Russian sage. Uh, this is a, a great plant. I could not find sugar content, um, but I think this is what's planted a lot of 59 in the media. Is Russian sage? Um, it's long blooming, it's adaptable to tough climates, and we can have some tough climates sometimes. Um, attracts the bees, so also very pretty. All in the, interesting that the ones we've been kind of talking about are in that blue family. And then herbs, a lot of the herbs, if you let them flower, will actually attract the pollinators um, quite nicely. So we've got thyme here, Rosemary. I've never gotten my rosemary to bloom, <laughs> um, but that's a pretty little flower. Yeah. And then what you've got? Let's see. The mint down here, and not peppermint. Um, oregano and basil. So this would be the oregano up here, and then the basil down there. So another little check. What pollinator is attracted to red flowers? <laughs> what section of the visible spectrum do bees see? <laughs> UV, blues. Should you plant a pollinator garden in thick trees? No. Why not? <laughs> 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 
which of the plants that we looked at has the highest sugar concentration in its nectar? How far can a bee fly in general? Bees in my garden, 
um, that was just, oh my gosh, and just, even my husband really enjoyed watching it. It's only an hour long. It's great. Awesome. So, so check out this library. And also tell them that you like her series and stuff too, so it's great to have this. Um, I want to give the speakers a hands up too. We have another one going, but they volunteered. I kind of waited until the last minute to get people to talk about the subject. So they didn't have very much time to do, put it together. So I mean, I'm very impressed so far what we've got on yeah. um, there. So thank you for doing your part. Get seats too afterwards, grab your seats. Um, anything else before we get okay. I'm gonna do some handouts for the gals that are doing the square foot gardening. Um, we only have 40 copies though, so if you're a household together, I would like to only give you one so you can share it. And other, otherwise, we're going to have to make some copies and you'll have to pick them up at the extension office if we run out. And, and that is my fault. Oh, well, we just didn't expect so many. The first so time we had it, we only had 31 people here. And then we did the house plans, we had 72 people oh, here. Gee. And I thought, well... 31, 32. I chose 40. Yeah, Big mistake. <laughs> so I appreciate that you all came. So this is Sandra here. They're Master Gardeners and Heather. So they're going to talk about square foot gardening. Jody is the one passing the stuff around. Then we have um, Diane, who's the vice, or the president. I'm the vice president. And then Captain. Captain? Yeah, yeah, Captain. Yeah, she's our secretary, or no, treasurer. For the master gardener so thank you all for helping too and okay. your turn before we start we had some discussion we had a wonderful public speaking class on how we were supposed to <coughs> present to the public <laughs> and the discussion came up is are you going to have people taking notes all the time and so we kind of looked at each other and we, we typed up this page you shouldn't have to take any notes everything should be on there that we're getting or not <laughs> or, or close to. Yeah. Okay, my question to you is, do you want a bountiful garden that gives you lots of produce with little weed? Yes. Yes. yes, we all want that, don't we? So square foot gardening is for you. And Heather and I are going to give you the whys to try square foot garden and the how to. So my my little spiel is on the why you should have square foot gardening. Um, how many people in here have any concept at all of a square foot garden? Would you raise your hand? Okay, well, so not very many. So let's show this in first. Okay, this is, we were gonna do this in the middle, but since you don't know what square foot, many of you don't know what square foot gardening is, this is a three by three square, okay? And then you divide it up into one square yard, or one foot, okay? And so you only plant in this square, radishes. You only plant in this square, pollinators. You plant in this square, a tomato. So when you're, you're thinking about square foot gardening, this is what you should be thinking about, okay? <laughs> So, in that case, how do you think it would be to plant this bit? Easy, hard? Easy. It's really easy because if I'm feeling really good, I might just plant three rows here, three squares. <coughs> well, really good, I plant the whole thing. But if I'm tired or I haven't planned my whole garden out, I might just plant the squares that I planned out at that time, okay? So one of the things for square foot gardening is it's very easy to do. It has a fast setup. You can put a square foot garden any place you want. So I could, I could put this on my front lawn. I'm trying not to take Heather's speed. <laughs> I could put this on my lawn. I could put it on my patio. I could put it in my garden in the back. That, this is easy to set up, it's easy to do, okay? Once you have to know how to do it. Um, it's very low maintenance, because usually it's in a raised bed type, okay? So you don't have all the weeds and things that perhaps you'll find in your ground garden. 
So it's easy maintenance. Um, oh, biggest thing, less weeds. You know, I'm going to tell you how this started. Mel Bartholomew was a man who gardened in his backyard in the 1970s, and he worked all day long, and then he came home and he tried to take care of his garden. And he came back in one night and said, I'm spending all this time watering, I'm spending all this time weeding, I can design a better way to garden than what we're doing now. So he came up with a square foot because he could come home from his job and go out and take care of his garden and get a lot of harvest with about a tenth of the work that he did on his big long row garden. Okay. Um, you're actually gardening in perhaps less space because if I have my big garden out in, I've got a row here to walk and this you'll probably have a row too. But as I'm walking on this in my garden, I'm compacting the soil, which does not make the best use of my soil. It's hard, it's not aerated, my plants are going to grow there, I'm going to have weeds there. So he says by planting in this, and this is my area that I have to grow, that I'm going to have a lot less work. And another thing <coughs> that happens because of weeds, because you plant your things so close together, they don't leave room for weeds to come up in the square. The plants keep them out. Okay. And um, I said no soil compaction, and it's user friendly. And we're going to show you how you can do this today. Heather built these. Okay, we do have some drawbacks to square foot gardens. But I have some solutions here for you. One is the bed depth. Usually you do your square foot garden six to 12 inches. If you're doing it on the ground, which I did, I just put a frame like this on the ground and did it. I don't have to worry about that. But if you're planning on growing beets and turnips and carrots, six inches is not enough. So you need to think when you build this, how deep you want it and what do I want to grow? So how we have a solution to that is we just make it a little deeper, okay? No problem. The other thing that happens on a, a raised bed like this, it dries out a little faster because it's above ground and usually the soil that we put in it is not like the soil that you have on the ground. It does not hold water as well, so it tends to dry out faster. So you've got to either water it more, or a good solution is, when you do your soil mix, which Heather's going to talk about, you put a little bit more of your ground, your, your basic topsoil in it, because that texture is a little heavier. So you add a little bit more of that in. Um, so you can add that, or gosh, they sell soaker hoses all over, right? Mm -hmm. So you just lay your soaker hose down through here, have it on a timer, you don't even have to water it. It just comes on by itself. So that's a solution for that. Um, the other thing a little bit <coughs> is space issues. I like corn on the cob. I mean, how much corn are you gonna have in there? <laughs> all right? But you can do square gardening a four by eight foot, and you could do four feet for your corn if you wanted. Or if this isn't good for corn, just plant four, you need more, but I could put four, I could take my whole row here, and corn I think it says four, so you put four so I would have 12 in a group right here. I do not want to plant the corn on the south side though because what does corn do? It grows up tall. It, up tall. it shades everything behind it. So if I'm, did I say north side? I, I do want it on the north side. So if you're planting larger crops like corn or tomatoes, or I like to grow watermelon and squash, I need to put those plants on the back side of my square on the north side. 
Also, some of the squash takes with a lot of room. I don't know if you've ever grown a pumpkin plant in your yard, you know. They're, they're pretty, pretty big. They cover a lot. I can put a trellis. Believe it or not, even pumpkins and watermelons will grow up a trellis. You kind of have to get them started and you have to support them a little more. But if you really want those in your square foot garden, it is possible to plant it by doing vertical gardening. So I kind of told you the, the why that is good to plant a garden. And Heather's going to show you or talk to you or tell you on the how to's. And it is when we have that two-sided page on there. So if you flip it over, I think Heather's stock was on the front and mine was on the back because I typed it and uh, I was a PE teacher. So keep that in mind. So as she said, we have this speaker class. And so I'm your speaker in training. So if you can't hear me, holler. <laughs> Thank you. And I also told Sandra, I says, will you hold my hand for this? And she goes, you're not in kindergarten anymore. And the little teacher voice came out. She said, grow up. So this is my attempt at growing up. <laughs> anyway, so we all know growing in Wyoming is very challenging. We have a cold growing season, colder than down south. We have a short growing season. We have low humidity. We have low precipitation. We have high mineral content in our clay soils, and we have not so much um, of the organic matter. We have lots of wind, and with that, sometimes we get hail. And with all that, if that doesn't deter you, then the deer will show up. <laughs> so, we have a lot to overcome. Um, and as Sandra mentioned, square foot gardening is a good solution to all that. Um, there's no compaction, there's um, no weeding between the rows, so it's, it's, it's great. But how do we do this? It's in the design, as she mentioned. So what I'm going to talk to you about is how to design your bed and build it. So first thing you want to do is you want to plan your bed. You want to go out into your backyard and look and see where does the sun shine. You need six to eight hours of sunshine for your garden to grow, for any garden to grow. So you want to see where the sun is. You want to see if a tree, a tree will shade something for hours a day. You don't want your garden in that shade. So you need to think about that. Another thing you need to think about is your water source. I'm a lazy person. I hate rolling up hoses. I can drag them out, but they never seem to get put back. So I want mine near a water source. You know, that's just me. Um, you want to be able to walk all the way around your bed because your bed, you're going to have to be able to reach in. You're not going to ever walk on your bed once you get it planted. So you have to be able to reach in the center from all sides. Um, three foot is good, because if you have a low bed, then you're going to be on your knees. And you want, you know, three foot, four <coughs> foot, you want to get a wheelbarrow through there? Think about that before, as you're planning your bed. Um, four foot would be good. Um, also, the last thing to consider is you want a relatively flat area. You put it on like this, your water's all going to run this way, you're going to forever be watering this in. Um, the next thing, all right, how do you want to build your bed? There's all kinds of things you can use. Everybody thinks square foot raised beds wood. You can use cinder blocks. You can use metal. You can put up a couple logs. You can use any number of things. Wood is just one of your options. What you want to stay away from is your um, pre-treated wood and like your railroad tries that have that creosol in it. Those things are not good. Those chemicals in that will leach into your soil and then you'll have that in your garden produce. And so steer clear of those for your, what you're going to be consuming. Flower beds, I use them, but I don't in my garden. Um, there are benefits to doing a raised bed for square foot gardening, but you can do square foot gardening on the ground. You don't have to have a raised bed. I do a raised bed, it keeps my pets out of, out of it. They don't walk through it. It also keeps my dog from peeing on my legs. So that's why I have a raised bed. And my beds 
are one's two foot tall, tall and one's three foot tall. That was my husband's idea. He says, when I'm in a wheelchair, I can still get up, you know? <laughs> so, um, now your bed sizes. You want to think about your bed sizes. Um, this is a three by three, a four foot bed, you know, where, where you'd have four of these, is as big as you want to go. Because like I said, you're going to have to be re reaching into the center of this to do your weeding, your planting, and your harvesting. So decide whether you want a three foot bed or a four foot bed. You know, how far do you want to go? Don't go over four foot. I think in Mel's books, he talks about four foot. Um, so your, how deep you make it, you decide. But you want to go in your square foot, um, you know, one, two, or three feet, four feet. You can make it as long as you want. You can have a three by six or a four by six or a four by ten. You get to pick. You know, just your um, your backyard, and you get to decide. If you're just starting, don't do a four by twelve. <laughs> Start a little smaller before you go. Well, why not? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if you're constructing a new bed. Um, you want to think about weeds coming up. So if you're putting it on grass, you don't have to dig up all your grass. You can put a weed barrier down. You can use um, landscape fabric. You can use cardboard. You can lay some cardboard down and then put your soil on top of it. You do not want to use waxed cardboard. The water won't drain through it for obvious reasons. You also don't want to layer and layer and layer cardboard. Because if you get too many layers of cardboard, same thing happens. The water does not go through. You can even use newspapers. You can go, I don't get the newspaper, but I go to the recycling center and pick up newspaper there. You know, why not? I'm recycling it. Um, and Sandra talked a little bit about your depth. Um, the book says a minimum of six inches is what you want to do for the depth of the bed. Um, mine, I have one that's 12 and another one that's two, 24. So you get to pick. My deeper root crops go in one bed and the other ones, other things go in the other bed. I even grow potatoes in mine. So, um, but just keep that in mind as you're constructing your bed. And like I said, when you are, if you're gonna do a square foot gardening on the ground, you are gonna have to dig down and make that dirt underneath. You're gonna have to to amend that and change that a little bit for your square foot gardening if you're not gonna you know, raise it up and add new soil in. So now we're gonna fill the bed. And all this is pretty basic what I'm going over there. Like um, Jody said, the library has lots and lots of good books on square foot gardening and gardening and all kinds of information. Um, this is just touch the top of it so that you have the basics to go out and start. <coughs> Um, so, Mel in his book talks about doing it in thirds. When you make, put your soil together, he has you doing a third of compost, a third of peat moss, and a third of vermiculite. And that is kind of, it's not a sterile, it just has no weed seeds in it then. It is a healthy, um, nutritious soil, but it's not what I use. Because you know what, that's also very expensive. <laughs> you know, I did look up on the internet today just to see if there was one. And there is a raised bed soil they sell, a SPOMA sells it. And it's 25 bucks for 1.5 square foot. Well, that's a little expensive too. So what I did though, is I used some of my topsoil. And I used probably 50% topsoil. Then I added in um, compost. And I did 30 to 40 percent compost because that's that has a lot of nutrients in it, and it also has um, some water holding capacity, and it's breaking up the clay soil because my topsoil is clay. And then I did 10 10 percent or so potting soil. What I used, um, I didn't go out buy it. I used I dumped all my last year's. From my all my containers, I dumped that in my garden and used that. And then I did have to add some, but why not reuse that? Because what that potting soil is doing is taking the place of the peat moss, because it's all 
somewhat like that. And you don't have to use peat moss. There's other substitutes for peat moss that are the same um, if you don't want to go with the peat moss. But so that's what I did. I recycled my potting soil. I probably had to buy a few more. And um, then I did add perlite and vermiculite to mine. Um, perlite and vermiculite are both minerals naturally occurring in the soil. What they do is they heat it up and they kind of puff up and then they help to hold air and moisture in your soil which is necessary for your plant roots. Um, and those you can buy at any garden store. Um, I think Walmart, Home Depot and everybody also has them. Um, the other thing I added into mine is a it's something I heard about a couple years and now I added in, it's called Biotone. It's a mycorrhizae that I add back into my soil. And that is something optional. I don't, I didn't read about it anywhere, it's just something I do. Um, it helps your um, roots and your soil and your nutrients, they have a symbiotic relationship. And so I dumped a bag of that in. So then, You've got your soil, you've decided on your soil, you've got it all mixed up. And remember, if you're doing it on the ground, you want to dig out some of that topsoil to add this in, rototill it in, get it mixed real good, and then never walk on it again. Because you don't want to compact that. That's part of what makes this system work real well. So then at the end, you're going to want to figure out what your square foot is. You also want to do a little bit of thinking about where you're going to plant things because if you're growing pole beans or whatever, you're going to want to put that lattice or that trellis or whatever you're going to use in there. You want to put that in before you start planting. If you're going to use an obelisk in the center, you're going to want to figure that out and what you're going to grow on it. You want to make sure you're not shading anything. So those are some things to think about as you go. Now when you go to mark out your square foot gardening, you can use um, pipe, that, uh, the white plastic pipe, PVC. PVC pipe, you can use slats, you can use string, I use string, and I like string because then I leave it up and it's not, nothing big and bulky in my way when I go to, re to weed and whatnot. The thing is, is when you use string, use screws, not nails, and you want to use something like a deck screw, my husband tells me, so it doesn't rust. I don't care if it rusts. He did. Um, but the one thing you do care about is you want to put your string around it and then screw it all the way down so you don't rip your arm open on it when you're weeding. That I've done. So, um, so you plan out, you do string, whatever. If you're doing your um, in the ground, that's when you would have to drive stakes in and do string if you're going to do it in the ground. But like I said, most of square foot gardening is done in a raised bed. So, like Sandra said, breaking the square foot gardening down into small, bite-sized pieces makes it so much easier to tackle. You don't have to tackle the whole thing all at once, as far as planting goes. Um, now, Sandra, you can talk about how easy it is to plant. Okay. Um, I would like you, on your handout, you should have a page like this. It's actually a three by three. And it, it says square foot garden planter. I got this off the internet. There are tons of free places that you can go to get information like this, all right? But this is for you because you're, you're going to want to take notes, okay? I had to call Heather up this year when I'm ordering my seeds and say, Heather, what kind of tomatoes did I plant last year? <laughs> because I shared, but I didn't write it down. <laughs> so she had to tell me what kind of tomato I bought last year. They were really good, I said. Um, so big red. Yeah, big red. <laughs> big red. Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> anyway, so you want to put notes. <laughs> Heather, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm sorry. I'm um, there's notes down here. If you want more of these, you can copy them off, or you can go onto the internet. So, 
you can write what you're going to plant in there, okay? Or you can do our little, well, I'll get that. This is for you. We want to tell you journaling is great. It is, you have to do it. Because then you, if you have a neighbor who doesn't remember what you planted either, then you're in trouble. <laughs> okay, the next one I have on here, this one isn't quite as interesting, but I did this one because, flip it over, here it tells all the plants and what sizes you're supposed to plant. But what happens if you decide to plant someone, something that doesn't tell you how many seeds go in the square? And here's a little formula on the back on how to figure out if it's some seeds that you bought that you can't find on a chart anywhere. But this is my favorite. It says, plant one. This is where you put it. Plant four. This is where you put it in your squares. Okay, so this is how we're going to be planting when you choose. And they've done this on the size of the plant and the amount of plants that can grow in that square foot. So if you're planting radishes, you're going to put 16 in. Oh, you? You didn't get colored. <laughs> My, I like the colors one better. <laughs> anyway, and I got this off the internet too. It was just on there. They're all free. Right. I'm, your, I'm Vanna now. Yes. Very good, Vanna. And Heather did styrofoam, and she poked holes for a visual look of what your square will look like. Okay? Everybody get a chance to see that? This one's, this one's more for my eyes. <laughs> this says that if you're going to plant peas, I'm pretty sure peas are four, that you would stick four in here. You can also three. use these as a planting guide. Oh, yeah. What you do now. You want to hold that. I'll be oh, down. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, just stick, well, stick your... So here's your square foot. And I didn't mention this. When you're, you're doing the grid or the thing, you can use a, a frame like this and remove it. And that's what these are, and I didn't even mention it. Um, but you can put this in your square foot garden. You take your little handy dandy whatever you have, make a little hole here, a hole here, a hole here, a little hole here, pull it up, plant your seed, cover it, you're done. Okay. You know, these these you can use. Also, if if you don't want to make a big one like that. I would recommend that you do use string though instead of, but I have a raised bed at the community garden and I might just take, mine is four by eight, and I might just take my squares and do, say this is my bed, plant, plant, plant. Plant, plant, plant. That's what I would do too. Plant, plant, plant. You know I don't know if you can see that back there, but. You know why I would I like this idea for me personally is you use it once a year. You're storing that little thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> then you're done. So when I go do it and I'm at the I garden at the community garden also. And so when you put those out, I do it in, on the ground, then I know I can I can visualize in in my thing squares what I need. And I put it in, then I can move it to the next spot. I can see where my little thing made a little indent. And then I'm only storing one thing. Okay, so when you are thinking about your squares, we just had information on pollinators. Herbs are great pollinator plants, all right? You can even use those after they grow in your garden. Mm -hmm. So um, usually, the really good ones are perennial, all right? When you're doing square foot gardens, if you plant a perennial, which means it comes back year after year, you're going to have to build that in, that you're not going to plant that spot anymore. But it's well worth it to bring the pollinators into your garden. So you do want to do pollinators 
even if it's not in your garden and it's a three foot bed, maybe on each end you want to plant a small pollinator garden or herbs so you can get the pollinators to come in. Some examples would be chives, thyme, um, you know, your mints, but mints you want to be careful. I wouldn't put it in there because they kind of take over. They will, but so they're great. They're the best pollinators. Right, the bees so love. So put them in a, put them in a, a pot, pot right and, next and to it. Stick them in. <laughs> right. Also, on your little chart your, that they handed right. out down there, Here it is. talking about companion planting. So, if I decide to put beans here, what companion plant can I plant beside it? And companion planting just means that they're beneficial to each other. Maybe one's a root crop and maybe one's one up above, so this one uses different nutrients in the bed than the one next door does. Tomatoes and corn are just voracious eaters. So if you have, they like nitrogen. So if you plant corn on the back side of your plant, your thing, when you journal, you know, and then you know you have to put more nutrients in these squares than you do down there. Because peas generate nitrogen. They're great. You don't really have to add more nitrogen to the square that you did peas. No, but it's good to know when you're journaling, this is a plug for journaling, that if last year you put corn here, this next year you put peas here. And don't put tomatoes, because it's a heavy feeder too. Yeah, so you can put peas there, that's going to put the nitrogen back in your soil. So journaling and companion planting, which I love this. The first one of these I got, we went to a convention in Nebraska, and I was selling Heather. I know it said companion plants, and I looked all over, I went on the internet, I went through my books, they all had it on page 24, page 48, page 79, and I didn't want to work hard enough to make one up for you guys to have them. And then I found my new one. It's got the companion plants on it. I knew I saw it somewhere. <laughs> anyway, so here is a question that I want to ask you. Do you feel confident enough to try a square foot garden this year? Yes. Okay. Oh no. <laughs> well, call Heather. She's really good at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We haven't talked about this yet. Oh, yes. Um, and we're going to do that. So, to try, we like to get hands on. Okay. Again, I was a PE teacher at elementary, so I'm very kind of steady. We have plan right now. Well, so what can we do now in our planning? Right. We can use a napkin. Which just happens to be all by 12. <laughs> Pretty handy. Right. And so, oh, I didn't give you seeds. Okay. Well, while she's getting the seeds, we're going to do for a couple more drawings. So this is what you can do. You want to come up and help us through here? You're going to put hand out. Uh, everything's handed out with the seat. Right? Yeah, like eight, eight five eight. eight. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's back in the corner. Oh, okay. I'll take her. So draw another one. Eight five four. Eight five four. Anybody? Well, I have eight six eight. Okay, what? Let me draw one. Yeah. Was it eight? Oh, what was it? Eight five four. Oh, I was talking and she didn't get to say me. Oh. Okay. Oh, that's okay. Maybe you have another one. <laughs> So, okay, this table has carrots. They are going to have to look up how many carrots go on their napkin. You have a toothpick and you have some glue and you're a very sharing table. You're going to share the carrots with you. And if you don't use them all, just leave them. Is mulch it. Does anyone know what I mean by mulching? 
Yeah. And that's just right. Easy. Mulching means that you cover the soil with something that keeps the moisture in. And remember I said square foot gardening lost water more quickly. So you want to make sure you mulch it. Grass clippings that have not been weeded and feeded are perfect. There's nitrogen in them because they're green. You know there's green, so that's nitrogen. But if it has weed and feed, the weed will kill the square foot garden. Okay? I save my leaves. We have a mulcher, and I save like four bags of leaves from the fall when I do it. And you can mulch with leaves too. And it will keep it um, moist underneath. And they break down and it becomes part of your garden soil and puts more nutrients in. So you really want to make sure you mulch. Another thing that I forgot to mention is if you're building your garden bed and you want to do a deep one like me. My husband put in a false bottom with redwood because he likes to weed eat around it and he, he had to have it raised. He just has his things and we let him be that way. Um, but if you have a, you know, you're talking about this, my wheelchair hype one. Um, you don't have to fill that with soil. What you can do is take some of your firewood left over from the year, put your firewood in the bottom of it to fill up space. That's gonna decompose and be nutrients for your plants later on. And it also helps you to not have to buy all that soil the first day or the first year. Um, you can you, you also, if you're going to have, if you're doing a, a small bed, I would use all soil. But if you're going deep, you can use that. You can also put some sticks or something in from your yard that can all go in there. And you can use straw yeah. and you can use leaves in the bottom third. If they will break down yeah. and your soil level will go. But you're going to add more soil every year. And compost. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Compost. Um, but your logs, if you're going to put logs in one, those won't decompose as quickly. But your leaves, your small branches, your hay will all shrink down pretty quickly. But it's all super good for your garden. It's good nutrition for your garden. It's probably something you would want to think about. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want another, can I just say, another thing you might keep in mind, um, if you do have a raised bed, your soil, after you've used it, and you water it, and it, the water drains out, you're leaching those minerals out of your soil. Right. So you will you will want to add to your soil every year. That's why the compost um, every year. Yeah, because if you go out if you go out from last year's bed, it's not going to be as good. And then if you do it again next year, nothing's going to happen. It's the other just, thing with my potting soil is you know those little beads of fertilizer they put in your potting soil. Well, it's never used up. So by putting my old potting soil in there, you can also <coughs> buy that and put that in their way at the bottom. It's supposed to go away in what six to eight weeks, but it still shows up in mine, mm -hmm. you know. But that that when you make it and you want to put it down at the bottom so that it's feeding the roots, it doesn't do much good sitting up on top. And if you use paper, they say don't use colored paper either. Yeah, right. No. Or glossy, nothing so glossy. So my question to you now is, you can go home and plant a garden that you can harvest much produce from with little work and don't we all want that mm -hmm. yes. thank you so much happy question yes you were talking about like the when you're putting your face oh down what different types of the newspapers and cardboard uh -huh. and stuff my question there is because i've used newspaper on my garden to keep the weeds down because it goes back into the soil it's really good for it wouldn't that happen the same way with cardboard or? Yes, it does. But if you use too well, much cardboard, right? Yeah. You guys but but my reasoning, okay. Go ahead. You have to forgive me for my no, little no, right no, here. No, you're good. But okay, you're doing it to block the weeds from coming yes. through, and it deteriorates, so it's not there. What's going to stop you? From but if you it. you have your bed going to the ground, it's a raised bed. Those oh, weeds aren't going to get in there. Because nope. of being raised. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Your um, weeds will come from the seeds. They might get a few. Yeah, they might get a few. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, you get weeds <laughs> from the top, but not coming up from they the bottom. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Thank you for clarifying. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the weeds 
water treatment plant compost oil be good enough for the compost, not the biosolids, yeah. but the compost. You can get biosolid, which means it has poop mixed in with it. <laughs> we don't want that. Treat it though. It's treated. But and then just the regular compost. And I would say choose the regular compost. Use the biosolids on your lawn or something. Right. Because I don't know about you, but I have a little slight hesitation finding carrots and biosolids. <laughs> <laughs> it's a personal thing. Yeah. Well, it's just that you can get that by the truckload for $20 a truckload yeah. out at the water treatment plant. But you want to yeah. you want to also add in if you're going to if it's a new bed you want to add in your peat moss you want to keep it to a third compost to start with you know any other questions? Okay. I never I'm not a rules person. No, she's not. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for coming. And <laughs> <laughs> like last night. Oh, so, you have this one square foot you garden. Like, you got this one square foot garden with your garden already planted. All you have to do is lay it on the top of the soil, and you have to know how deep to plant it. It's usually what one to one and a half the diameter of your seed. Right. So if you've got a really tiny seed, you barely cover it. But you want to cover it enough. So the wind doesn't blow it out. Yeah, right. So maybe a rock or two in a corner helps sometimes. You know, then pick it up later so you don't have rocks in your soil. But you want to hold that down. You want to keep it moist and cover it with your soil. So I did it so I couldn't see it anymore. You don't see a lot of white, but it's not very, very heavy at all. 